Good morning, everyone. Before I begin my presentation, I would just like to thank Jasmine for allowing me to submit this short video, as unfortunately I cannot be with you in person. And this research belongs to a much bigger project on satire generated by the aesthetic movement and Oscar Wilde in particular. The parodic poems that appear in Punch uh, in 1881 and 1882 are only part of a much bigger campaign led by Punch against the East Thetes. In fact, the campaign against the East Thetes was very wide. We have The Colonel, the play produced by Francis Bernand, who was, of course, editor of Punch by 1880. We have Gilbert and Sullivan's famous operetta, Patience. We also have musical songs. Uh, characterizations of Wild appear in contemporary novels. So uh, many people claim that the aesthetic movement itself is best known through the satire uh, generated through magazines like Punch. The parodies of his poems belong to a much wider tradition. In fact, he was only one of many poets to suffer this particular indignity. Swinburne's A Century of Randalls prompted a parody competition in the Weekly Dispatch. And I discovered that this was not an uncommon uh, feature. The prize in this instance was awarded uh, to one Henry William Hancock for Farfetched and Dear Board. Though I'm, I would imagine that the prize of two guineas was not as important to him as getting his poem published. Farfetched and Dear Board, sure this volume of verse is, though ever as clever in rhyme and thought, and yet though a master each round will rehearsals, far-fetched and dear bought. I've quoted this from Walter Hamilton's parodies of the works of English and American authors, six volumes of this. Hamilton is best known for his history of the aesthetic movement. He obviously had a mind that liked collecting and cataloging, which is why his anthology runs to six volumes. And it's clear that Wilde belongs to a very um, healthy tradition. So included in the sixth volume, sixth volume are Wilde's contemporaries, Algernon Swinburne, George Robert Sims, Robert Browning, Frederick Locker Lampson, Austin Dobson, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Martin Topper and Matthew Arnold as well as Wilde. And I'm showing you the frontest to the sixth volume that dates to 1889. Punch was particularly irritated by the resurrection of antique forms, which they saw as being particularly pretentious. There was a whole section of Hamilton's sixth volume devoted to ballads, rondeau, villanelles, and triolets, which were very much associated with Austin Dobson, who was uh, reviving these archaic forms and also with Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who published a translation of one of Francois Villon's famous ballads, translates as Ballad of the Dead Ladies in 1870. So Punch was particularly scornful of the affectation of these archaic forms. The Rondo in a rage, pray tell me why we can't agree to bid the merry muse run free, Pray tell me why we should incline to see her in a rondo pine. Or sigh in shackled minstrelsy. Why can't she sing with lark like glee and revel in bright jeu d'esprit where form can't fetter or confine? Pray tell me why. Again, quoted uh, in Hamilton's parodies. And of course, Wilde was particularly fond of using these archaic forms. Punch's campaign against aestheticism is well remembered. Richard Ellman, who wrote one of the definitive biographies of Wilde, uh, comments, great fun was made of his flowing locks, his lilies, his rondeau, and other French poetic forms. The Grosvenor Gallery, blue china, usually oriental blue, poems entitled Impressions. His name became Oscuro Wilde Use. Draw it to Wilde, the wild-eyed poet, Brother Jonathan Wilde and Ossian Wilderness, the last two published after Wilde's departure for America. They also misappropriated his titles, so Impression de la Autumn, Spectrum Analysis after the Burden of Itis, In a Peacock Room of Variation, as the Cult of Intensity also appeared to have spawned a totally incomprehensible meta-language, Punch also made fun of this. 
intense, tutu, and utterly utter provided much mirth. Edwin Millikan's An Aesthetic Rondo of April 1880, published even before Wilde's poems were fully in print in his slim gilt volume. I am utter, men may say, that I am void of brains and beauty, that my feet are huge and splay, that I'm limp from crown to shoe tie, that my taste mad bad will blow, that my talk is maudlin splutter, that the Philistine must own I am utter. You can sort of read through the lines there, but some of that is directly angled at Wilde. He was a big man, remember. Francis Bernand, who was appointed editor of Punch in 1880, was aided and abetted in his campaign against the East Beats uh, by uh, his anonymous writers. In fact, one of the problems with, with Punch is tracking down who wrote what. You need to go to the Punch archive, which is held in the British Library. At the time, these writers complained that because of the, all of the verses and prose were anonymous, that this meant that Punch did not attract the very best writers who were building their reputations. By comparison, we know all about the cartoonists who were allowed to sign their work. Uh, du Maurier, Lindley Sanborn, Charles Keane, and Harry Furness. However, Edwin James Millican did become famous through the creation of his rather horrible character, Ari. Um, who was rash and crass Cockney. Henry Savile Clark is best known for staging Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Joseph Ashby Sterry is uh, best known in Punch and Further Afield as they were collected and sold as anthologies, The Lays of the Lazy Minstrel. Augustus Moore is the lesser known brother of the famous Irish novelist, George Moore. So I've been able to find out about uh, four of my leading writers, but Philip Newman remains shadowy. The only thing that I could pick up from the ledger was that he comes from Croydon. And this is what our cast of characters look like. The uh, Millican and Ash Ashby Sterry are courtesy of Harry Furness. Millican appears to be responsible for the poems that include the Oscuro Wildy Goose in their byline. La Fui de Oin is a stand-up of La Fui de la Lune, um, the piece of the moon being turned into the piece of the geese. To outer senses they are geese, dull drow drowsing by a weedy pool, but try the impression, tick, cool, cool, snow slumbering sentinels of peace. And you can see that as the poem goes through, it's making fun of sort of, of aesthetic pretensions um, because low and the light in aerial track athwart the dun means the mud. Millican's impressions by Oscuro Wild Goose de Snon Snorets uh, was published in the Almanac for 1882 with the byline here relating to nonsense or twaddle and both more impressions, La Fui de Oin, and uh, the second uh, poem uh, refer to poems published by Wilde in the Irish Monthly and then reprinted in Pan April the 23rd, 1881. My little fancy's clogged with gush, my little lyre is false in tone, and when I lyrically moan, I hear the impatient critics tush. But I've impressions, these are grand, they're dabs of words mere blobs of tint displayed on canvas or in print. Men may laud and think they understand, a smudge of brown, a smear of yellow, nail, no tail, no subject, there you are, impressions. And the strangest far is that the bard's a clever fellow. Now this is clearly making fun of not only impressions by Wilde, but impressions by James McNeil Whistler who was closely associated with the French Impressionists in the 1870s. Their first exhibition held in Paris was in 1874, and they shifted to en plein air painting, that's painting from nature directly out of doors, to uh, paintings that had no obvious subject or tale to tell, and were really about colour, hence mere dabs of words, mere blobs of tint. So here, Punch is really picking up on the way in which 
poets like Wilde were drawing on visual culture using terms like impression and variation. James McNeill Whistler was very fond of using musical terms in the titles of his own paintings like symphony, harmony and nocturne. And clearly Punch did not like this collapsing of the two elements, painting and poetry. And so this is the real thrust of the parody. Edwin Milliken was also responsible for the Too Too Awful Sonnet of Sorrow by Oscuro Wild Goose. This is having a real go at the dado. Punch really disliked the aesthetic preoccupation with interior decor, of which the dado was a really important element. This is a rail below which you have a frieze. And as you can see, in Africa, they have yet to discover the importance of the dado as the mayor conjectures that it was possibly an ecclesiastical term rather than part of one's interior decor. The poet then harks on about dark Africa. It then references uh, William Hurrell Malloch's philosophical treatise, Is Life Worth Living Without a Dado? It goes on to reference the sweetness and light of Matthew Arnold, which of course is all about the higher culture until we get to the last couplets. What is a dado weep till all is blue? Ye who hope to see our planet soon lapped in the Elysian limbo of Tutu. Philip Newman's Impressions de la Tom uh, stanzas by the much admired poet Draw It Mild is a direct parody of, of Wilde's poem, The Garden of Eros which opens, it is full summer now, a heart of June. And the parody begins, it is full autumn now, and yet I know hard by there is a little dusky dell, where still Apollo's planing hyacinths below, brushed by white feet of dryads from the well. The poem goes on to reference scrumping, because we are indeed uh, autumn. There is a beauteous boy who crops one of these beautiful rosy apples. But then the poem ends with a go at the aesthetic preoccupation with Japan. From dear Japan, that perfect house of art, O oh, autumn, how thy beauties stir a young Endymion's heart. And of course, Endymion was the title of another of Wilde's poems. Millikan's East Thief to a Rose by Wild Goose, however, does not directly reference the poem by Wilde, Rather, it's Edmund Waller's Go Lovely Rose. October 1881, you can see how these parodies are coming thick and fast. And this is really having a go at aestheticism, uh, particularly in the lines like that she naught knows of the new cult of intensity. And it's this idea that if you want to be beautiful, uh, the new aesthetic ideal is not fit and healthy. The ideal is uh, to look slightly ill, to be very pale, uh, to be rather limp, to always be suffering. Uh, the idea is that there is always something beyond the aesthete. He's striving, yearning, pining for something that he will never attain. And this leads, of course, to a death wish. So the last line is, you can see how little of art's praise they share, who are not sallow, sick and spare. And that is much more a reference to the um, rather ethereal maidens of Edward Byrne Jones. Philip Newman's Spectrum Analysis uh, by the Wild Eyed Poet is another parody of one of Wilde's poems, The Burden of Itis, and as written as a parody by Newman, making fun of aesthetic culture. Sunflowers on the dado wall, paisley shawls, you know, a reference to Wilde's poems creamy vellum blossoming into gold and straggling sonnet, but sweet far, if ever gliding shape, a sun pale spectre should his shadow, shadow dread, attend my lonely footsteps or escape from its dim world to hover around my bed. The end of the poem shifts quite distinctly to seeing ghosts, because of course it was published on the eve of All Hallows, 31st, of October. So there was also a link between the spectral ethereal bodies of the aesthetes and ghosts 
but it becomes quite topical at the end. As you can see, there's a reference to the Daily Telegraph, which encouraged writers to send in any reports of sightings of ghosts. So it shifts from having a go at aesthetic culture to focusing on the topicality of All Hallows Eve. My last two, Augustus Moore's impression, The Legaity Theatre by Ossian Wilderness, was after Wilde had left for America, where, as you know, he had nothing to declare but his genius. This uh, really is just uh, in playing on the concept of impression, and we're looking really at a poem that singles out the emergence of the Gaiety Girls, or one in particular, Phyllis Broughton. The uh, Ossian Wilderness byline is, is picked up in March of 1882 with a cartoon by William Paget and a very long prose piece about wild Ossian with variations. So I uh, love that line at the top of the second verse, sweet new Salome of our English land. I fain would offer thee a Bradlaw's head. Bradlaw, uh, as you see the cartoon from Punch at the Dock, MP for Northampton was an infamous atheist uh, that many would love to have rather like John the Baptist uh, taken off his head. Uh, he was sent to prison on a number of occasions for not taking uh, the oath of allegiance. If I could keep my word that this I write, John Keats like poet of sweet motion, tread one other poem and I'll clap my hand and take another stall tomorrow. So it's quite interesting that this again is linking poem, in this case, to movement, as Phyllis Broughton here, writing in a sort of autobiographical piece in one of the daily newspapers, I made my debut at the Gaiety in what I believe was the first of the three Decca burlesques, and her dance was very much uh, admired. So one of the famous Gaiety girls, I thought you'd give, a, give you an idea of their unique character. And then finally, again, very topical and with, a, again, a cartoon to go with it. So sometimes the cartoons and the texts get separated. You wouldn't necessarily think that Murder Made Easy had anything to do with Oscar Wilde at all. So Murder Made Easy, A Ballad Alan Mode by Brother Jonathan Wilde, which is really just uh, looking at the different uh, culture, really, of America and England, because this is about well, making murder easy. It's to do with the poison panic of the early 1880s, where certain poisons were restricted. In this case, aconitin, which is why we have in the cartoon a retailer saying, aconite, so we only sell, poison, sell poisons to medical men, but anything in revolvers and dynamite. So it's a lovely thug um, who is looking for something to kill somebody with. And I love the, the middle lines, freedom we can't and we won't do without even the freedom that maims or kills, which does make you think currently in America of the Second Amendment. But that's the last time that Wilde's name is made fun of directly in Punch. There are lots of other asides, lots of other parodies of aesthetic culture. Um, that go on right the way through 1882 and even into 1883. But that's the last one to actually cite Wilde's name directly um, in the title. So thank you very much for your uh, patience with this presentation. I really would welcome any feedback. So there is my email and also my website. If you forget my email, my website is even easier, anne-anderson.com. My thanks to uh, Jasmine again for letting me um, offer this new research. As I am straying into a totally new area, anybody that can just give me some uh, pointers in terms of this really interesting tradition of parodying uh, famous authors or any pointers that you can give uh, about these themes and parody, I would uh, warmly welcome. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.